Hey, thanks for dropping by and checking out this message. These lessons come from our Sunday gatherings at Victory Christian Church in Franklin, Indiana. Our 5th through 8th graders meet at 9 or 10.30 a.m. and our high schoolers meet from 6 to 8 p.m. If you find that this content brings value to your life, then please consider subscribing and hitting that bell so that you can be notified when we upload our next message. Our hope is that this video brings more clarity into your life as to who God is and what He wants for you in light of who Jesus is and what He's done for you. Enjoy and have a great day. Here's, here's the deal. It's great to be invited to things, right? How many, how many of you, you love to be invited to something, right? There, there's, it, it just, it's, it's nice to be wanted. It's nice when somebody else invites you to something. I think you're lying when you say no. Unless you're just a super introvert and doesn't want to talk to anybody ever. Well, most people like the... Raise your hand if you like to be invited. Okay, you're outnumbered. Just, just so you know. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but but there's, there's lots of reasons we might say yes to an invite, though, right? It, it, it might be because whatever's happening sounds like fun. Uh, it could be because, like, whatever's happening is something that you're curious to see how it will turn out and so you you go and sometimes you say yes because you feel obligated and so you kind of you your brain says no but your mouth says yes i'll be there and then you walk away and you're like why did i say i would be there i don't want to be there right and there's a number of reasons that we would say yes to an invite but if we think about probably the number one reason that we say yes to an invitation anywhere it's it's the the yes to the invitation is because of the who that asked us, right? If, if you, you know, if you're asked to the coolest thing on the face of the planet by one of the people you respect the least, you probably will not go. But if you're, you know, if it's somebody who you would just love to spend time with and they, they, they ask you to come, you would come and watch paint dry with them if they were the ones that asked you, right? So it, it depends on who asks you to do whatever and you'd be down for anything if it's with somebody that you, like at least or you want to get to know better and, and so having that yes it is is much more attached to the who than the what the who can be far more important than the what but for for most of us it's really difficult because when we talk about faith and we talk about how we're supposed to like you know invite people to church invite people to whatever like it's it's really difficult. How many of you, the idea of inviting somebody to church like kind of terrifies you a little bit? It's like, how do I even bring that up without being weird, right? Like, I, I deal with that, right? I, I feel like, you know, it, I have some neighbors that I'm trying to get to know a little bit better, and they're not Christians. I think they're agnostic or leaning maybe towards atheism, and, and you know, I'm, I'm trying to, like, put some relational points in, in my bank account with them, and, you know, I don't know the best opportunity to invite them to something because... What if they say no, or what if they don't ever want to talk to me again because I invited them to something that they're, you know, avidly against or something? So asking somebody to come and get to know Jesus is, is you know, a really difficult ask sometimes. We're afraid that we won't know what to say, won't have all the answers, or won't know what to do if we end up having a conversation about faith. How many of you, those are some of the fears that you have? Like, I'll invite them, but what if they ask me this and I don't have an answer for that? Right? I think it's Peter who says, you know, like, be prepared always to have an answer for the hope that you have. Give a reason. And, and so sometimes we, if we've grown up in church, we've heard that verse. We're like, well, I don't know if I can explain the reason super well. I just know that I believe it because I've heard smart people talk about it or whatever. And so sometimes, uh, you know, throughout all of Christianity's kind of past, if we look back in the past couple hundred years, there's a lot of ways that we have tried to invite people into the faith. If you think about, like, anybody seen those bumper signs or, or the, the uh, billboard signs on the side of the interstate? That's like 1-800-TRUTH. Like, who is G Jesus will save your soul, right? We, I actually... I was with somebody, I think I was Carol with you and some other people on the show me trip, and we're like, we should call that number and see what, it, it was like an automated, it was actually kind of cool, I was pleasantly surprised, um, but it, it gave some good information and where you can go to get more information and basically here's what we believe, and it was like all in three sentences, it was pretty cool, uh, but, but 
usually those aren't typically the most effective methods of evangelizing. Um, but some, some other things are like bumper stickers. You guys see the people that drive that have the bumper stickers that are like Christian ease. And uh, you most of the time hate those drivers because you're like, oh, you're of the faith. You should be a better driver than you are, right? Which is why I refuse to put a Christian bumper sticker on my car because I don't want the way I drive to reflect the things that I believe because I'm not a very nice driver sometimes. And so I, I'm careful of that myself. But other ways that you've probably seen people uh, try to invite people into the faith is by guilting them to death. Um, and you, you've ever been to a big city like Chicago or New York, or I've even seen it up in Indy where, you know, some guy will sit with a, a speakerphone on the corner and start yelling about how drugs is, is of the devil and you're gonna go to hell if you don't, you know, repent. And, and then it's like, wow, that, does not sound appealing to join the faith. I'm a Christian and I don't want to join the faith. You know, the way that guy's preaching, right? And so, like, there's ways that Christians have tried to evangelize, but what if we could come up with a way that was less awkward, less scary, and more effective when it comes to sharing your faith? Does that sound like something you wish you had the ability to do? I don't know, that's something that I'm trying to work on. And, and, and so today we're going to talk about that because it, it goes like this. If we want people to say yes to an invitation to follow Jesus, then we need to be the type of people that other people will say yes to. Because most of the time, you don't accept an invocation, invitation because of what is happening. You accept an invitation because of who is asking. So what if we were actually the type of people that... The people we wanted to come into the faith wanted to say yes to. And, and that goes a little bit deeper. And it's a little bit harder than just the knowing the right words to say or any of those things. It actually is a little bit more uh, kind of uh, it asks more of us because it means that not only do we have to be on our best behavior the day we know we're going to invite somebody, but it means we have to be on our best behavior anytime we're around anybody else because they're watching us. And if they see the way that we act and it's not something that they want to be a part of then why would they ever say yes to an invitation you extend to them? And so, what if we were the type of people that the people we wanted to come into the faith wanted to say yes to? And so, today, I really just kind of want to challenge us with that. You know, we're going to be reading through the, the book of John, and um, there's just this awesome, when you, when you read John, if you know anything about the Gospels, there's what's called the synoptic Gospels, which is Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Okay, synoptic meaning they're, kind of synonymous. They say a lot of the same things. The terminology is very similar. Um, they tell a lot of the same stories. They're the synop synoptic Gospels. Um, but John is not one of those. His Gospel is a little bit different. Um, it's written by the Apostle John who writes about himself in that book that he's the disciple whom Jesus loved, meaning like not to brag, but I'm going to brag. I was his favorite, right? And so how would you like to be one of the other disciples reading the Gospel of John, being like, whoa, wait a second. I could just imagine Peter getting a little fired up about that. But, but I love John's perspective on the Gospel. And one of the things that he says a lot throughout the Gospel is come and see. Come and see. Come and see. There are certain languages and terminologies that are used throughout the different books in the Bible, but one of the consistent ones in the book of John is come and see. And it's, it's, it's this invitation, not only, basically it says that what I want to show you, I can't just explain it. You have to experience it. And so it's one of those things that John is writing and, uh, and he tells the story of when Jesus invites uh, Philip to come and follow him as his disciple. And, and Philip starts to do it. And Philip goes to his buddy Nathaniel and he's like, hey, um, you need to come and see. You need to come and follow this Jesus guy that just invited me to be his disciple. You need to come too. And so uh, th this, this is how that interaction kind of takes place. This is in, uh, in John chapter 1. Verse 45 and 46. It says, Philip found Nathanael and told him, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law, and about whom the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. So he's basically saying, like, remember back, you know, when we were in Sunday school and, and we were learning from, you know, the law of Moses and what all the prophets talked about, about the Messiah that was supposed to come and rescue us, right? And, and Nathanael's like, yeah. And he's like, I found the guy, yeah. It's like, Jesus of Nazareth. And here's, here's what Nathanael says. Nazareth, can anything good come from there? Come and see, said Philip. I Meaning Nazareth wasn't known to be like, you know, it's, it's kind of like 
It's kind of like saying, I want to be a movie star, but you live in like no town Kansas. Like, where are you going to go be a movie star? Where are you going to start an acting career? Right there, or you, you got to go to like to LA or something to do that. And, and so, so when they're expecting this like prophet, this Messiah, and he says he's from Nazareth, it's like, you mean from Podunk, Kansas? Like, what, what good can come from there? And Philip just says to come and see. Come and see what it's all about. Experience. I can't explain. Just come and experience this truth. And what, what if we were the kind of people that the experience of being in a room with us changed the room? Oh, what if, how many of you, let me ask you this way. Um, what if uh, you guys been in a room where there's like another Christian or you've been in an environment where there's someone else that you either know that goes to your own church or to somebody else's church. You just know that they profess to be a Christian and you want nothing to do with them because they are not a very attractive personality to be around. In fact, they're draining. They kind of seem condescending sometimes, right? You've all probably been around people like that. And, and so what, what if... What if we were the type of people that we lived in such a way that other people wanted to chase what you were chasing? The experience of being with you was something that they wanted to have for their lives. They just felt better being around you, encouraged by being a part of your life, or being a part of your class, or being a part of your team. What if you were the kind of person that lifted the room? Do people see your life and think, I would like to be more like that? Do, are, are you considered trustworthy by the people closest to you? Or are you known to badmouth people behind their back? Are, are you the kind of person that younger people want to look up to? Do you treat people so well that they feel better just hanging around you? Do you look out for people? Do you treat people with respect even when they don't respect you? See, what are the things that sets the experience of living life with you different than the experience of living life with other people. In fact, we should be missed when we're not around for something. As Christians, I love the way that, that Matthew talks about it in, in probably his greatest sermon. In, in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus is doing the Sermon on the Mount, and he says that Christians are the salt of the earth. You guys heard this before? Now, salt is, is a good thing because it like makes things better when you eat them. Can you imagine like pretzels without salt? Like... Uh, you, you know what one of the main ingredients of Cheetos is? Or not Cheetos, Doritos? It's salt. Good guess. That's a leading question right there. You know actually what makes chocolate chip cookies taste good? There's a pinch of salt in them. Right? Uh, you're, you're, what you could confess better than I because you cook all the time. Is salt in pretty much everything to make it taste better? Yeah. So like when Jesus says that we're supposed to be the salt of the earth... He's saying that everywhere we should be, we should make that place, we should make that experience better. You know, he, he makes you better, and he makes the world around you better. Not only that, there should be a noticeable difference when you are absent. People should notice it's kind of like cookies without salt. You, you notice that something's off. You kind of wish that that salt was there. And that's kind of the point here. And, and what's even cooler is that when Jesus was hanging around with all these people, he invited the, the people to follow him and be his disciples. He went and, and partied with the tax collectors and the sinners, and that's what the Pharisees hated about him, the religious leaders of the law. They didn't like Jesus because he hung out with the people that were supposedly unworthy of hanging out with. But, but everybody wanted to, to get to know Jesus and to follow him, and here is teaching. And here's the thing. Uh, People who were nothing like Jesus liked Jesus. People who were nothing like Jesus liked Jesus. And the question I have for you is that are, are the people in your life, are, are they benefited by being with you? Are you a likable person? Do you, do you treat people with respect? That's kind of what we're looking at. If we want to invite others into a life with Jesus, we actually have to live like Jesus. Are the people who are nothing like you, do, do they at least like being around you? And if the answer is no, or you don't know, then, then I don't know, maybe that's maybe some reflection you should do there. 
Chasing Jesus means sharing him with them. It means that we leave nothing up to chance, that we live our lives in such a way that, that people who are nothing like us, like us, and would say yes to an invitation to come and see. And so next week, actually, you guys have the perfect opportunity for that because we've got our Super Bowl party. This is the perfect opportunity to invite somebody to come and see what this is about. I promise we'll make it fun on this end if you do your part and invite others to come and see. And so uh, this, this is a perfect opportunity for you to practice it this week. But when people look at you, do they lean in and ask, why is your life this way? Hey, hope you enjoyed this video. If you liked it, give it a thumbs up and make sure you're subscribed so you're notified when we upload future videos. Have a great day.